Hello everyone, I am Dr. Sneha and welcome to Perio Hub. So if you are new to this place then Perio Hub is a YouTube channel where we discuss dental and periodontology related topics and if that something interests you then please subscribe and tap the bell icon. So today we are going to discuss about dental calculus. So let's get started. So we've spoken about dental plaque and we've spoken about the microorganisms associated with plaque. So when this plaque gets mineralized, it gets hardened, it forms a layer called as the dental calculus. So calculus is a hard deposit that is formed by the mineralization of dental plaque on the surfaces of natural teeth and prosthesis. So the first part of the definition is quite clear. It is formed by the mineralization of dental plaque. And the second part of the definition says that it is formed on natural teeth or prosthesis. So remember, both plaque as well as calculus is only formed on non-shedding surfaces. So you will not see plaque formation and calculus on the gingiva or the buccal mucosa because these are the shedding surfaces. So the epithelium undergoes constant shedding. Whereas uh, if you take restorations, the teeth and the prosthesis, these are non-shedding surfaces which facilitate plaque and dental calculus formation. So the term calculus is derived from Greek literature where calcis means limestone. So the calculus has a limestone like consistency. Now there are other names also given to calculus such as tartar. Now this term was given by a German physician named Paracelsius and other terms such as odentolithiasis and fossilized plaque can also be used for dental calculus. So this is an important MCQ question and it can also be asked in Viva. So just remember these other terms as well. Okay, so now let's talk about Hippocrates. We've spoken about Hippocrates so many times on this channel and today we're going to talk about him in regards to dental calculus. So he was the first person to have spoken about. In fact, he has written about the association of dental calculus with oral diseases. And later on, it was Albuquerque's who basically used certain instruments to remove the dental calculus and he saw that once the dental calculus was removed by these instruments the oral diseases subsided so approximately for 5000 years calculus was termed as the primary etiological factor for the initiation and progression of periodontal disease but later on studies which was done by low et al through the experimental model of gingivitis it showed that it was not the calculus but the plaque which was responsible for the occurrence of gingivitis in a group of individuals. So this particular experiment was a landmark study which showed that it is not the calculus but the plaque and the microorganisms associated with the plaque which are responsible for inflammation and subsequent attachment loss and bone loss. So remember this point. Now coming on to the classification of uh, dental calculus, it can be classified uh, through three major modalities. So firstly, based upon the location, it can be classified into supragingival plaque and the subgingival plaque. So if we take this as the CEJ or the cemento enamel junction, the gingival sulcus is usually 1 mm coronal to the CEJ. So this is the gingival sulcus and the calculus which is formed coronal to the gingival margin is termed as the supra gingival calculus. Whereas the calculus which is formed beneath the gingival margin or apical to the gingival margin is termed as the sub gingival calculus. So the visibility of supragingival calculus, it is visible th to the naked eye, whereas the subgingival calculus cannot be seen. It has to be examined with the help of a probe or through an explorer. Coming on to the color, the supragingival calculus is either whitish or yellowish or it also imparts the color of the food that we take, whereas the subgingival calculus is somewhat greenish or brownish in color. Next is the consistency. Now supragingival is hard in consistency, it is clay-like, whereas subgingival is hard in consistency, but it is flint-like. So if we take a rock and we scrape it and take the flakes, that is the consistency of the subgingival calculus. Now coming on to the composition. Now though we'll be talking about the composition of dental calculus in the later half of the video, just remember the supragingival calculus has high quantity of brucite and octa calcium phosphate crystals. 
whereas the subgingival plaque has less amount of brucite and octacalcium phosphate and more amount of magnesium vitelloke crystals. Now the last point which is also the, the second way in which we can classify calculus is based upon the mineralization. So supragingival calculus because it is exposed to the saliva is mineralized through saliva and it is also called as the salivary calculus whereas the subgingival area is not exposed to saliva instead it is exposed to the gingival exudates from the GCF and other components of the gingival sulcus. So this is termed as the seruminal calculus. So right now we've seen two ways based upon the location into supra and subgingival and based upon the mineralization into salivary calculus and the ceremonial calculus. Now let's talk about the third way in which we can classify. Now this is based upon the formation and accumulation of calculus in different individuals. We can classify them into non-calculus formers, slight calculus formers, moderate calculus formers and heavy calculus formers. So this classification is based upon the rate of accumulation or formation of dental calculus. So now let's move on and talk about the prevalence of dental calculus. Now it was seen through the National Health and Nutritional Examination Survey. Now this was conducted between the years 1988 to 1994. And it was seen that 91.8% of the individuals had the presence of the supragingival calculus. Whereas only 55.1% of the individuals had the subgingival calculus. So this was seen in a group of 9,689 people. It was a study which was conducted in the US. And it was seen that the prevalence of supragingival calculus was far more than the subgingival calculus. Now the second study which we'll talk about was conducted by Anirudh and Lo et al. So this study was a CPITN study which was conducted over a period of 15 years wherein there were two groups of individuals taken. So first group were the academicians from Norway and the second group were tea workers from Sri Lanka. So it's but obvious that the academicians from Norway were educated. They were privileged to have good exposure to all the dental care facilities whereas that wasn't the same in case of the Sri Lankan tea workers. Now when these people were studied it was seen that in case of the Sri Lankan tea workers there was constant accumulation of calculus that took place and it was seen that by the age of 40 years most of the teeth except for the premolars was covered by calculus in case of the tea workers whereas in case of the Norwegian academicians it was seen by the age of 40 to 45 years 70 percent of the individuals were calculus free so the interproximal areas did not consist of any calculus so this study basically emphasized the role of the dental care to prevent the accumulation of dental calculus so in the last section of this video let's discuss about the composition of the calculus like any other component uh, the calculus is also formed by the inorganic contents and the organic contents so inorganic contents are present in majority so approximately 70 to 90 percent are the inorganic contents and only about 10% are the organic contents. Now coming on to the inorganic contents, the elements that can be seen in the dental calculus are 39% is calcium, 19% is the phosphorus and we can see traces of sodium, zinc, aluminium, magnesium etc. Now if we talk about the components or the molecules, 70% of them are calcium phosphate molecules. 3% are the calcium carbonate molecules and we can see traces of magnesium phosphate molecules. So if we talk about the third component of the inorganic group which is the crystals, it's quite important so make sure you remember them. So 58% of the crystals is formed by the hydroxyapatite, 21% by the octacalcium phosphate, 12% by the magnesium vitloki and 9% by the brucite. And again, remember, brucite and octacalcium phosphate are seen in majority in the supragingival calculus, whereas the magnesium vitloki crystals are seen majority in the subgingival calculus. Now, coming on to the organic contents, so it's mainly formed by a complex of proteins and polysaccharides. 
So here we see approximately 9.1% of carbohydrates. So glucose, galactose, mannose, fructose. So these are the carbohydrates that can be seen. 8.2% are formed by amino acids and minority that is traces 0.2% of lipids can be seen. So with this we come to an end of the part 1 video on calculus and I hope this video was helpful and informative. If it was then please subscribe and like, share this video with your colleagues and please do leave your feedbacks in the comment section below. I'll be meeting you very soon with my next video and until we meet next take good care of yourself. This is Perio Hub signing off.